So now we'll talk a little bit about geomicrobiology. Um, and then if anyone has the answer to this, let me know at the end of the, at the, end of the lecture. So, so I also want to acknowledge uh, Christina Smeaton. So the work I'm presenting is really part of, uh, she's a postdoc in my group. And so we've been working on this uh, together. So bioenergetics obviously refers to uh, energetics, so the, the flow of energy uh, in the microbial ecosystems and how that refers to geomicrobiology. But we'll look at that from a very practical viewpoint. How do we use this to basically describe how ge geomicrobial systems function? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of background, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this, but microbes, and microbes comprise things like bacteria, but also archaea, fungi, uh, other microorganisms. There's now a, f a third clad of uh, microorganisms that have been discovered. Uh, they're fundamental to the cycling of carbon and all bioactive elements on, uh, on the earth. So the cycling of nutrients, elements like nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, silicon, you name it. Uh, they're very closely involved with uh, weathering processes, soil formation, soil fertility, and ultimately the transformations that they uh, induce on these bioactive elements also has a big influence on water quality. Uh, organic matter decomposition, transformation, and preservation. In fact, it's the balance between uh, photosynthesis and organic matter decomposition that controls ultimately the oxygen and CO2 levels in, in the atmosphere. And of course, if you preserve organic matter, then some of that might actually turn into coal and oil and other uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, formations. Uh, microbes are probably among the biggest producers of greenhouse gases and other reactive gases. Uh, they're involved in biomineralization processes. For instance, uh, many of the calcifying organisms in the oceans, like coccolithophores and foraminifera, are actually uh, unicellular microorganisms. Um, from a practical viewpoint, uh, particularly in the field of contaminant hydrology, natural attenuation and bioremediation processes are all related to the activity of microorganisms. Obviously, biotechnology all the way from making beer to uh, new products, etc., and in the field of green biochemistry, and this goes on and on and on and on. So microorganisms are essential to essentially most of what goes on in nature, but also in, uh, in industrial processes. Okay, so here we're probably more interested in what happens in uh, the subsurface. And that's an illustration actually I stole from, uh, I think from the uh, Berkeley National Lab. Uh, and if you can see, I'm not sure you can see it from the back there, but you have things like uranium-6 going to uranium-4 here. You have iron-2, nitrate, oxygen. So all these chemicals that in the subsurface control the reactivity of, of the subsurface. But if you think about a subsurface, or at the surface of the earth, you have uh, higher organisms like plants and animals. Uh, they tend to disappear very quickly as you go down into the subsurface. And so the subsurface is really dominated by microorganisms, and therefore they're mainly microbial ecosystems. And when you talk about an ecosystem, of course, you have, and if you want to know how these things function, uh, you have to think about all the ecological interactions, so the interactions between organisms, things like competition. I mean, obviously, different groups of microorganisms might be competing for the same substrates. Uh, syntrophy, where essentially one microorganism produces something that then used by another microorganism, which might actually produce something that's used again by the first microorganism. Things like predation. So there are, of course, uh, multicellular organisms living in the subsurface that actually feed on microorganisms. And of course, when we talk about ecological interactions, energy flow is always very important. How does energy being transferred from one group of organisms to another organisms. Then what makes life more interesting in the subsurface is of course that we have very complex reaction networks. And by reaction networks I mean all reaction, these are reactions all coupled to one another. So one reaction produces something that's used in another reaction, that's used in another reaction, etc. So you have these very complex networks where of course microorganisms play an essential role, but you also have a lot of abiotic geochemical processes also. So surface catalyzed redox processes for instance. But what, and that's where the thermodynamics is going to come in, these subsurface environments, if you go sufficiently deep, are typically energy limited, right? So what's the major source of energy fueling the biosphere? It's a question. The sun. Okay, but the sun only affects what's at the surface, right? 
So at the surface of the Earth, the sun is basically the big energy source. It's abundant. Typically, it also depends on what latitude you are, etc., whether there's clouds. But essentially, the surface has, the surface biosphere has a lot of energy directly from the sun. Of course, that doesn't apply to the subsurface. There's no sun penetrating down in the subsurface. So the subsurface depends on different energy sources. Now, some of these energy sources are deep earth energy sources. For instance, hydrogen that's produced in the mantle that slowly seeps up, that can serve as an energy source. But mostly it's the leftovers of what's produced at the earth's surface, the leftovers organic matter that has escaped decomposition in the surface soils that ultimately makes it into the subsurface that is going to feed these microbial ecosystems. But that's kind of the leftover. So the, the, you can think about the subsurface microbial ecosystems as feeding on the leftovers of what's produced at the surface, right? So very often these systems are very much energy limited environments. And that's why, of course, if you're an ecosystem and you're limited by something, you're gonna try to optimize the use of that something, right? So optimization of the use of energy is something that characterizes subsurface uh, microbial organisms. All right, now, are there biologists in the audience? One biologist? <laughs> okay, that doesn't count. So we'll reduce life to something very simple. Life is essentially redox chemistry. Are there chemists in the room? <laughs> no chemists either, okay, well. So I just offended one person. Usually I offend about half the, half the people in the, in the room. So <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about what we call metabolism, if you're a cell, all the chemical reactions that take place in the cell is what we call together metabolism. And so metabolism is, oh, is composed of two parts. There is catabolism and there is anabolism. Right? And so catabolism is really that part of the metabolism that serves to generate energy. Essentially, you can think about catabolism is essentially this generates ATP. And ATP is the energy currency of the cell. It's actually the energy currency of all cells on Earth. And anabolism refers to biomass synthesis. So when a cell, for instance, undergoes cell division, and from one cell you form four cells, and from four cells you form 16 cells, etc., you produce new biomass. So this Biomass synthesis, essentially it's, from a chemical viewpoint, it's mostly polymerization reactions, where smaller molecules are assembled into large molecules, lipids, proteins, uh, DNA, RNA, etc. And what is shown down here is that central to both catabolism and anabolism is the availability of electron donor substrates. Now, this is what, that's, electron donor means that this is a substrate that can give off electrons, right? So in chemical terms, how would we call an electron donor? That's a reduced substance, right? A substance that's reduced, has a lot of electrons, and can get oxidized by giving off these electrons. And so when the electrons are given off to a terminal electron acceptor, that's how energy is generated. All biological energy on Earth is generated by taking electrons from an electron donor and giving it to an electron acceptor. So for instance, what is for us the electron acceptor? Oxygen. oxygen. So we respire, we use oxygen. So oxygen is our terminal electron acceptor. What are our electron donors? Hmm? Carbs, for instance, the food that we take in. So these large organic molecules that we eat at lunch, those will be our electron donors, right? So that's how we generate energy. Now, in anabolism, you typically also need electrons. For instance, uh, we, for instance, we take up uh, our carbon to make our cells from our food, but you have other organisms that, for instance, take up CO2, right? If you take up CO2 and you form organic matter, so let's, for instance, make uh, glucose, what's the oxidation state of carbon here in CO2? Oxidation state, plus four. And in glucose, anyone figure out what the oxidation? It's zero, 
So this carbon is reduced relative to CO2. So to do that, to reduce that carbon, you will need four electrons, right? Take one carbon at plus four to zero, you have to add four electrons. So if you're an autotroph, what we call an autotroph, you will need electrons also to synthesize your biomass, right? But everything is based on the transfer of electrons. So in other words, life is all about electrons, right? So does anyone know what kind of the latest or, well, the current theories about where life originated on Earth? The location. Thermal vents, hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean. There's a lot of different reasons why that would be where life would originate on Earth, but the main reason is what comes out of a hydrothermal vent. Yes, electron donors. If you take, for instance, hydrothermal vents today, I mean, hydrothermal vents, the way they function is seawater is drawn into the seafloor gets heated up because there's a magma body, reacts with the minerals that are present, and essentially the fluids that come out contain a lot of reduced substances. Things like hydrogen sulfide, for instance. So the, the reason why we think that life originated at these hydrothermal vents, it's not because of the heat. Because you can't do anything with heat. Heat is a useless or mostly useless form of energy. Not completely. But, but electron donors, <laughs> that's a great source of energy because you can think about these hydrothermal vents as essentially spewing out electrons. They, of course, bound to chemical compounds, but life was able then to evolve by saying, hey, there's, elect there's terminal electron acceptors in the ocean water, in the seawater. If I can transfer these electrons, these reactions will generate energy, and it's capturing that energy that essentially means life. So life means capturing energy. In fact, you know, you've probably all seen science fiction movies where they go out and search for life, and then they say, oh, we have to find a carbon source. Bullshit. What you have to find, no, it's true, it's true. And if you look now, for instance, the search for life, the NASA program, well, it's not going to last very long with Trump, but the NASA program, the search for life, is essentially searching for places where you have reduced substances and oxidized substances. Because if you have electron donors and electron acceptors, you can transfer electrons from the electron donors to the electron acceptors, and that is the main source, at least on, on Earth. It's the only source of biological energy, all right? So that's why I say here life is really uh, redox chemistry. So we'll take an example. Now, usually, except for our single biologist and our non-existing chemist, I show a chemical equation, everybody goes, oh, chemical equation. Chemical equations, it's like accounting. If you can. If you can uh, balance your, your checkbook, you can do chemistry. Huh? So we'll take this. And so there's a lot of words here. Aerobic cell growth. Well, there's aerobic. What does aerobic mean? Oxygen. Cell growth. So we're going to grow cells on citric acid. So citric acid will be the substrate that is going to be used. So it's the chemical compound that the cells are going to use. And then we have this macrochemical reaction. I'll come back to that. But a macrochemical reaction really is when you combine catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is a chemical reaction. Anabolism is a chemical reaction. And if you combine them, you get the metabolic reaction. So macrochemical reaction also referred to as a metabolic reaction. So what we expect to find in the metabolic reaction, and so I'll write the overall reaction. Later on, we'll combine them. We'll have citric acid, we'll have oxygen, and we'll produce biomass. So this would be what this reaction might look like. So this is our citric acid. So the C6H8O7, that's the citric acid. So it's a six carbon molecule, so it's a small molecule. And typically, when cells grow, they use small molecules. And here you have your oxygen, and I also have a source of nitrogen. I just put in ammonia, and this is my new biomass. Now, this is a very kind of simplified representation, chemical representation of biomass, but it gives kind of the the general proportions between carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. I also produce CO2, produce some hydrogen and water, that's, that's fine. So what you see is that on this side, I have one source of carbon, it's citric acid. That, car that source of carbon is gonna be the source of carbon for my new biomass. So the citric acid is indeed the substrate that is used to synthesize new biomass. But it's also the source for CO2. Now, if you take citric acid, and you oxidize it with oxygen, 
you'll produce CO2, right? That's what we do, right? When we, so in our, in our cells it's mostly glucose, when we respire glucose, our glucose is transformed into CO2. Why do we do that? Why do we, why do we respire? <laughs> to generate ATP, to generate energy. So this carbon that is going to CO2 is, so I could here add in plus energy. That is, the production of the CO2 here is the respiration process, is the process that generates energy. But I also use part of the carbon to produce new biomass. So what you see is that the cell is going to take its citric acid or the carbon in citric acid, say, okay, a fraction of that is going to go to biomass production, a fraction of that goes to energy production. What do you think is going to determine this proportion between how much goes to energy production to how much goes to biomass production? Yes, but let's assume that there's abundant oxygen. You still have to appropriate it. You have, you have a bunch of carbon, right? And you say, some of that carbon I'm going to invest into biomass. Some of that carbon I'm going to invest into energy production. How are you going to decide how much is going to go to one or to the other? Hmm? The state of the cell. But more important, if you look at it from this viewpoint, to produce this new biomass, you're going to need energy, right? So you're going to have to respire enough carbon to CO2 to produce enough energy to actually synthesize your biomass. So it's going to be an energy balance. If I know how much energy I need to create biomass, I also know for a certain amount of biomass how much energy I need to produce. So everything is going to be about, energy, uh, about the balance. So these little stoichiometric coefficients, the A, B, C, etc., those will actually determine, will be determined by how much energy is needed for biomass production. Does the energy stay higher on the right than the left then? It's actually a bit Yes, and so the energy is basically by oxidizing this carbon to CO2 with oxygen, you actually, that is going to generate energy. So at least you need to produce enough energy to produce whatever biomass you, you might get. So that will be a theme throughout this presentation. How do you balance, how do you make your energetic balances, right? Yep. Well, first of all, you, well, if you want to, for instance, if you're in an, in an environment where conditions are very favorable, what life, the whole purpose of life is to reproduce itself, right? You are going to be successful if you produce, you produce, you reproduce yourself faster than a competitor, right? So why that is, that's something that God decided, said, <laughs> life, you're all about reproduction. So that's, and so we're all about competing, so we're competing, so we're doing that. <laughs> of course, you could say, well, yeah. Sorry, maybe I'm not that familiar with the question, but why that formula for new biomass? Like nitrogen and CO2, do I really need Well, this is just if, no, so the way you can think about this, the way I'm writing is, is I'm writing it to make one carbon mole of biomass. Okay. We'll come back to that. So if you produce biomass for one <laughs> mole of carbon, you approximately need 0.2 moles of nitrogen, 0.6 moles of oxygen, and 2 moles of hydrogen. So you can think about it if you take cell, kind of an average cell, and you mush it all up, and you run it through an elemental analyzer, this will be the numbers you get out of it. So, and of course, you can, you can, there's other stuff in biomass. There's phosphorus, there's sulfur, so you can expand this. So this is to keep it simple. We're really focusing here more on the carbon than anything else. So just to put the uh, oxidation states, you can see you figure, if you work out the oxidation state of carbon, so remember, oxygen as always oxidation state of minus two, except in molecular oxygen. Hydrogen is always plus one, except in molecular hydrogen, H2. So knowing that, you can actually calculate that this carbon has an oxidation state of plus one. In the CO2, as we saw there, we have plus four. So we are oxidizing this carbon from <coughs> plus one to plus four. So we need essentially to remove three electrons from this carbon. This tells you that this is an electron donor, right? But also what you see is that to go from this carbon to this carbon, you have to reduce it. So this carbon has to, you have to take one of these carbons and you have to add electrons to it. So you have to reduce the carbon of the citric acid to produce the carbon in the biomass. So what you have here is an example of where citric acid is both the electron donor for energy production, 
It's this carbon going to the CO2, but it's also the electron donor for biomass synthesis. It also gives off the electrons that are needed to reduce this guy to this guy. All right, so, but that's kind of an example of one of these metabolic reactions where you now have N catabolism, production of CO2, and anabolism, the production of new biomass, in one single equation. That's, that, that's what we call the macrochemical reaction. Now, for the stoichiometric coefficients F, A, B, C, D, etc., if you figure out your energy balance, you will figure out what this A, B, C, D, E, F, and G will be. And so we'll see how we can do that. But this is probably one of the central concepts in uh, what I would say geomicrobiology or biogeochemistry, if you want it. It's the growth yield. That's that fraction. That's essentially, if you know what the growth yield is, you've answered the question. If I have a certain amount of citric acid, how much of that goes to biomass production? How much of that goes to energy production? So it's the new biomass produced per, per unit of substrate utilized. The substrate here being my citric acid. So if I use the A, B, C, and Ds, if I express the growth, the growth yield in carbon mole biomass per carbon mole citric acid, what's the growth yield be going to be equal to using these symbols A, B, C, and D, and et cetera? How much new biomass do I produce? D. How much carbon mole have I used? Carbon moles? Six. six times A, because I have per A mole of citric acid, I've got six carbons. So in this particular case, the uh, growth yield would be D over 6A. If I express it in moles of carbon biomass over moles of carbon uh, citric acid. So it's always important to specify those units when you talk about a growth yield. Because you could also say, well, if I express it in moles, carbon moles of biomass over moles of citric acid, it would be D over 6. Right? So make sure you always have these units uh, correct. All right. Does this make sense so far? Right? Okay? But one thing I want to point out is that when you do these things, obviously you have to have your reaction right. If you start with the wrong reaction, you're never going to end up having a right uh, solution. All right, so reoxonation. So, <coughs> as you know, the, the atmosphere is highly oxidizing. We have uh, how many percent oxygen in the atmosphere? 20, 21. So, our, our, our atmosphere is highly oxidizing. Right? What's the ultimate source of the oxygen in the atmosphere? That's the primary source, the initial source, very early on there during the Archean. And what did the cyanobacteria do that produced the oxygen? Hmm? Photosynthesis. photosynthesis. So the ultimate source of oxygen in the atmosphere is photosynthesis. So throughout, say, starting about 3.5 billion years ago, cyanobacteria started producing oxygen. And so since then, oxygen has been produced. So why doesn't the oxygen keep going on and on and on and on and up? Because it's being consumed by what? Iron. By? Iron. Iron is part of the story, yeah. But mostly it's because photosynthesis produces organic matter, produces oxygen, and what consumes the oxygen? The decomposition of the organic matter, right? The aerobic respiration, right? So we have organisms that produce oxygen, organisms that respire oxygen. Now, <coughs> so the Earth's surface. Everything at above the Earth's surface is highly oxidizing, right? Because we have a highly oxidizing atmosphere. If you go to Venus or you go to Mars, there's no oxygen. So there we have had processes where essentially the oxygen production or the oxygen consumption at some point exceeded oxygen production and the oxygen went to zero, right? That's why it's difficult to live on, on Mars. But for the Earth, everything is oxidizing. Now, if you start going inside soils and you go deeper and deeper below the groundwater level, Typically what you find is that you very quickly run out of oxygen. Because in the subsurface there is no photosynthesis. There is no production of oxygen. But there's still consumption of oxygen. Right? So things become depleted of oxygen. And what you typically get then is a geochemical zone or reoxygenation. So this is an example, for instance, for marine sediments. But you would find the same essentially 
if you go down into an aquifer that is in an organic rich uh, setting, for instance, <coughs> in a shale setting, or if you go to a freshwater sediment, what you have is at the very top of the sediment, you still have oxygen. And then you see that the oxygen goes away. In marine sediments, this can be anything between millimeters to maybe a meter that you have oxygen, and then the oxygen goes away, and you enter what's typically referred to as post-oxic or sub-oxic. And in the post-oxic and sub-oxic area, first of all, what you see is that you also have the disappearance of nitrate. You have things like manganese 2 plus appearing, iron 2 plus appearing. Deeper down, you see the sulfate going away. You get hydrogen sulfide produced, and ultimately you enter a zone where you start forming methane. So what you're seeing here is a very progressive zonation of redox conditions going from highly oxidizing conditions to highly reducing conditions. But if by the time that you have methane, you are under highly, highly reducing conditions. So we call this a redox stratification or redox zonation. And it's always, you can go to anywhere in the oceans. If you look at the redox conditions in sediments, you always go from oxidizing conditions to more reducing conditions, to more reducing conditions, to more reducing conditions, to more reducing conditions, to more reducing conditions. Right, and so you have a whole bunch of processes that are associated with that. You also find this, for instance, in aquifers. And this is a classic picture. I mean, it's very schematic, of course, where you have a contamination. This is a contaminant, organic contaminant. Could be benzene, uh, could be dean apples, you name it. And so you're introducing into the subsurface an organic source, organic matter. But remember that organic matter is an electron donor. So it releases electrons. Electron donors or reducing substances create reducing conditions, right? And so what you typically then find is away from, so the groundwater flows in this direction, away from your source, you get this redox zonation where the most reducing conditions are right at the contaminant zone and the more oxidizing conditions are at the fringe of the, uh, of the, of the plume in this case because it's the clean groundwater that contains the oxygen, right? So, you have here, if the other way to look at it, in redoxonation, if you go from the edge of the plume inwards, you see this redoxonation from highly oxidizing to more reducing, to more reducing, to more reducing, to more reducing. Why do we get that? Energy. It's all about energy. So, if you live out, if you live out here, you have access to oxygen. If you use oxygen as your electron acceptor, Remember, you're, you're supplying your electron donors. This is your electron acceptor. If you can use oxygen, use oxygen. Why? Because it gives you the most energy. If you run out of oxygen, use nitrate. Because nitrate is also a very powerful oxidant, will also give you a lot of energy. And then you go to manganese, and then to iron tree, and then to sulfate, and ultimately, you're left with CO2. If you use CO2 as your electron acceptor, you generate very little energy. So in other words, what you see here, the, the, the picture that appears here, and again, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons why this is not a perfect picture, but what you're seeing here is that the microbial community, the ecosystem in this subsurface environment is trying to optimize its energy production, right? So this zonation is really the subsurface microbial communities optimize energy production. That's the whole goal, that's their whole mission in life is to say, okay, well, given the chemical conditions in which I live, how can I optimize the amount of energy I'm getting? All right? So obviously, the organisms out here are energetically much more favored than the microorganisms living here. Now, why would you then do, in this case, you produce, you, you produce methane out of CO2? You do this because you don't have anything better, right? You, you work with what you have in your environment. Okay, so far so good? Yeah. Some bacteria are very versatile and can use a lot of different electron acceptors and electron donors. Some can only use one electron acceptor. So you have certain aerobes, for instance, that can only use oxygen. For instance, we're not a micro, but if you think about us, we cannot use another electron acceptor but oxygen. If the oxygen runs out in this room, we all die, basically. But you have a lot of aerobes that can also use nitrate. There's very few aerobes that can actually use sulfate, but there are some, so they can switch. 
But mostly in a subsurface environment, you have enough metabolic diversity that wherever you are, those functions can be turned off and on. Right? If you're a microbiologist, you're really interested in what specific organism is doing this, what specific organism is this. If you're more of a geochemist, you say, well, I know the functionalities are there. When is the functionality turned off? When is it turned on? Right? So we're trying to say, okay, well, how can we describe a system like this? So what we need is ways to describe the chemical activity of the microorganisms in such a plume. Yeah, can it thrive in an aerobic uh, Usually not. But it can, for instance, produce methane that an aerobe can oxidize and they can have a syntrophic or symbiotic relationship. So you can have, very often, and that's why this picture is not very accurate, because very often what you have is that, hey, if you produce hydrogen sulfide, there's probably an organism that's going to say, hey, I can use this hydrogen sulfide as my electron donor. All I need is an electron acceptor. So for instance, you could use iron tree. So at the border here, you would probably have, say, a hydrogen sulfide oxidizer that uses ferric oxide, or maybe manganese-4, or nitrate, etc. Right? So these, these, these uh, systems tend to really optimize whatever is made. So you really want to, that's why you have all these symbiotic relationships in these microbial activities. But the, the, the function is that, <clears throat> so last week you looked a lot about how you describe transport in a system like that. If you ultimately want to be able to describe a plume like that, you have to have, to have mathematical representations of the processes that, say, transform iron-3 to iron-2, or transform CO2 to methane, or combine hydrogen sulfide with nitrate, etc. So how do we do that? Well, <coughs> let's go back in time to the 1940s. That's when Jacques Monod, basically, <coughs> he was a, quite a, I mean, he became a very famous, you know, when you're a PhD student, you're not famous. You become famous later on because you've done something in your PhD that actually, well, you know. So he was actually, this was part of his, uh, his PhD thesis. <coughs> and he was actually working, he did most of his research during the Second World War in Paris. So it wasn't very easy conditions to work in. And so he had to do something simple. And so he took a very versatile microorganism, Escherichia coli. You've all heard about E. coli or Escherichia coli. It's a very simple organism. It grows very well. And so he would basically <coughs> take a um, uh, growth medium, essentially inoculate the growth medium with Escherichia coli and see how fast they would grow. So he would essentially count cells. Right? He was looking at cell division and how fast that proceeds. And so he came up with this equation, very simple equation, which says that the growth rate, or the rate at which bi new biomass is being created, is proportional to the biomass itself. Right? And the mu here is known as the specific growth rate. <coughs> so again, I can, again, say something nasty about microbiology. Because microbiologists call this a specific growth rate. As a chemist or a geochemist, you say, no, that's not a growth rate. That's a growth rate constant, right? Semantics, semantics, but it, it, it plays a role. So it basically says if you take your growth medium, you inoculate a certain number of cells here, you inoculate with double the amount of cells, the growth rate will be faster, twice as fast in the system where you have double the amount of cells, right? If you integrate this, what kind of a growth do you get? How is the, it's gonna be an exponential growth, right? So this gives rise to exponential growth, right? So, but then he said, okay, well, what does this guy depend on? Well, this guy, this specific growth rate constant, depends on things like temperature, but it also depends on how much food is available to the microorganisms to grow. So he was growing his E. coli with glucose. So he said, okay, well, Let's take a growth medium with little glucose, more glucose, more glucose, more glucose, more glucose. Let's inoculate it with the same number of cells. And lo and behold, what you find is that if you had essentially very little glucose, you would see very little growth. If you had a lot of growth, a lot of glucose, you would see a lot of growth. Makes sense. And so from that, he derived the famous Mono equation, which says that the uh, <coughs> specific growth rate constant, or growth rate, is equal to a maximum growth rate, specific growth rate, and then a dependence on the growth limiting substrate that looks like this. So S is the limiting growth, the limiting growth limiting, no, the limiting growth substrate. So that is a substrate here. So this would be your glucose, right? And the Ks here is the half saturation constant. 
So this is a very simple but also very famous and very actually very robust representation of microbial processes, which says that if S is equal to zero, there is no growth, right? If you put S equals zero here, the growth is going to be zero. What happens when you increase S? Well, when you increase S, obviously this number is going to increase, but this number is going to increase. So the, the denominator and the numerator are both increasing. So if S becomes very, very large, think about if this goes to infinity, you essentially have, well, let's not take infinity. Let's S much, much larger than Ks, then essentially this becomes S over S. So it goes to one, which means that your specific growth rate goes to its maximum value. That's why we call it the maximum growth rate. So what you get is this very, very characteristic saturation kinetics, where as you increase your growth limiting substrate, Initially, you start here at zero. Of course, if you don't have substrate to grow, you don't grow. So the growth rate is zero. You start adding more and more substrate, the growth rate goes up. Initially, it's fairly linear. And then, ultimately, <coughs> you asymptotically reach your maximum value. And the half saturation constant is called that way because it's the substrate concentration at which the growth rate reaches one half of its maximum value. So, <coughs> why is this? Well, think about, you know, these places where you have like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? So you go in there, and they just started opening the restaurant. So they start bringing out the food, and everybody goes on the food and like shove it on their plates, and, and, and they bring out more food and more food and more food. And what you see very quickly is that people are like, oh, I'm too full. I can't eat anymore. <laughs> so they basically reach their maximum here. And the reason for that is if you think about a cell, I mean, if you want to use glucose to power your metabolic engine, the glucose is outside the cell. You have to get it inside the cell. So there are these, these mechanisms at the cell, at the membrane, that allow it to bring in the glucose. You can think about it as a door. You open the door, the glucose comes in, you close the door. You open the door, another glucose comes in, you close. But any given cell only has a limited number of these doors, right? So, and you can only open and close the door with a certain maximum rate. So when all the doors are open and closing at, as fast as they can, you've essentially reached, has, you've reached the maximum rate at which you can bring in the glucose into the cell and you can process the glucose. So essentially what this, what this shows is essentially a very fundamental characteristic of microbial physiology. You have to process the glucose. There is always a certain maximum limit at which you can process the glucose because the rate at which you have to bring it in and the rate you have to process inside the cell. Right? And so this is found for many, many biological processes, right? Yeah. But, uh, this is example, because we have new cells and then new doors, so then it has to solve this problem. Well, this is, yeah, but this is why it's, <laughs> it refers to, um, oops. This is the specific growth rate. You can think about this as the growth rate per cell. So this is, you can think for one cell. And that's why if you look at the growth rate, so the dx dt, you multiply by x. So if you have more cells, yes, your overall growth rate will be faster, but it's because you have more cells. Okay. <coughs> There's no thermodynamics in here. It's all kinetics, right? So you get this parabolic relationship. So, but here you see the difference between the microbiologist and the geochemist. The microbiologist says, well, how fast are my cell reproducing? How fast is the number of cells increasing in my system? The geochemist who is interested, or the chemist who is interested in the chemistry of the system says, well, how fast is the glucose being used up? So how do we relate how fast the cells are growing with how fast the glucose is being used? What is going to relate those two? We've already seen it. The growth yield. The growth yield, so the connection between microbial growth and the chemical kinetics is through the growth yield. So if you look, again, S is my growth limiting substrate. So I have a minus because I'm consuming the substrate. Here you have your, your max, your X, and this parabolic depends on the substrate concentration. So this was my microbial growth rate. This was this guy. If you divide it by the growth yield, you can relate both. So the growth yield is really what relates the change in the chemistry with the growth of the, of the, the microbes, right? 
So that's why it's important because ultimately this equation, and this we would refer, it's also referred to as a michaels menten kinetics, essentially tells you how fast the substrate is being consumed. But of course, it depends on how fast the microbes are consuming the substrate, so it also depends on the growth rate. So in a batch experiment, like the ones that Jacques Monod would do, he would basically inoculate his growth medium with glucose, with his E. coli, he would count his cells, but he could also measure the glucose. So the number of cells would go up and the glucose would go down. And in an experiment like that, in principle, what you do, yes? Five minutes left? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe a bit more we start with some yeah. So you start off with a system with a lot of substrate and a low biomass. <laughs> so here this this is my X here. Your substrate is being consumed and your biomass increases, so your growth yield is simply the slope of that line. All right. Let's see how much we can do in five minutes here. Okay. Let's take another example. So sulfate reduces, so these are microorganisms that use sulfate as the electron acceptor, so they don't use oxygen, they use sulfate, and they're growing on hydrogen. So if you see that, you have sulfate and hydrogen. Which substance is the electron donor? Which one is going to give off the electrons? Which one is the reduced, reduced substance? Hmm? Sulfate? No, hydrogen. The hydrogen is the reduced form of hydrogen, so that's the electron donor. So the hydrogen basically can produce protons or hydronium ions and give off the electrons. So it's the hydrogen that's the electron donor, so the sulfate is the electron acceptor. <coughs> so, <coughs> Sorry? Mm -hmm. I thought you said that hydrogen was, uh, had a zero uh, energy like No, no, it doesn't have zero energy. Every molecule has energy. And the energy is the potential chemical energy is the energy stored in the chemical bonds. This is the oxidation state. The what? Oxidation state. Yes, so that's an oxidation state of zero. That's not the energy. You go from an oxidation, zero, uh, oxidation state of zero to an oxidation state of plus one. So essentially, you have to get rid of electrons, and so that becomes the electron donor substance. So when we then reduce the sulfate, what do we produce? What happens when sulfate is being reduced? H2S, the, the rotten egg smell. So you basically you take your sulfate and you produce sulfide. So your sulfur goes from, what's the oxidation state of sulfur here? Plus six, it's plus six here and it is minus two here. So you need eight electrons to go from this plus six sulfur in sulfate to the minus two sulfur in sulfide. So to combine those two, what do we have to do with this, ex with this expression? We have two electrons here, eight electrons here, so multiply by four, so you take your two half reactions, and you get your catabolic reaction. Now, this is a catabolic reaction, so this is the reaction that is going to generate energy, right? So you could also think about it here, plus energy. So, but is that enough? Well, think about catabolic reactions in thermodynamics. So this is a chemical reaction. Uh, do you remember if you had constant pressure and temperature, under what condition, what is the criteria we can use to determine whether this reaction is going to go forward as written or not? Anyone remember that? Gibbs, Gibbs energy. So if you have constant pressure and temperature, you can use a quantity called the Gibbs energy. It used to be called the Gibbs free energy. We dropped the free because nothing is free in life. And so, <laughs> practically. And so essentially, that Gibbs energy, it's represented by G, has to be negative. If the Gibbs energy change is negative, it means that what's on the left side here is at a higher energy state than what's here. And in nature, spontaneous processes always go from high energy to low energy. If you take, for instance, I won't drop it, if you take an object and I let it loose, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. What is decreasing? What energy of this object is decreasing as it's falling? The gravitational potential energy, and it's transformed into kinetic energy. Well, your chemical potential energy is decreasing, and part of that energy, the Gibbs energy that is decreased, can actually be used to produce ATP. 
So if this condition is satisfied, that reaction can actually be used by a microorganism to produce ATP or to generate energy. We also say that the Gibbs energy is the usable energy, right? It's the energy that can be used to do something with. This yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll show you how you do that. But if, so if you're in an environment where this condition applies, you can say, well, this is a possible reaction. The sulfate reducers should be happy. They should be able to do that. If your condition is such that it actually is a positive number, then it's going to be, then essentially what it means that is to run this reaction, you would have to supply energy on this side. If you have to supply energy on this side, you cannot produce ATP. You basically have to run the energy. You, you have to supply the energy. So for a catabolic reaction to be usable, this condition needs to be satisfied. So the question then becomes, how do you determine what that delta G is? So now comes the magical equation, right? You don't need to know where it comes from. You just have to tattoo it somewhere on your body so you can have <laughs> a look in the mirror. <coughs> because most chemical thermodynamics reduces to this. Where the delta G, I'll come back and I'll break this down. The delta G, so the change of the Gibbs energy of a particular reaction, is given by some, what we call a standard Gibbs energy of reaction. That's simply a reference value. We have to choose, of course, how we define this reference value. But once we've defined it, we have this. And then we have R, that's the gas constant, T is absolute temperature, and the nanotron of this Q. And this Q is known as the reaction quotient. So just to break down those two parts, so that's, again, my equation here. So this standard state Gibbs energy. So it's the Gibbs energy of that particular reaction under standard state. Now, I can guarantee you every year I ask this to my class, I said, what do we mean by standard state? What do we mean by standard state? Hmm? Wrong. They always do this. <laughs> And you have to hate chemical physics, physics, physicists for that. There is a total difference between standard state and what we call standard conditions. So, and unfortunately they use standard conditions here. Standard condition, that's your 25 degrees Celsius and one bar. It used to be one atmosphere. That's just standard condition. It's nothing to do with standard state. The definition of standard state is when all the activities of all the reactants and the products in your reaction are equal to one. Now, how you define those, again, you have to go to a certain number of conventions. And so at some point in the early, um, in the early previous century, they brought all these physical chemists together in one room. <laughs> don't, no, don't think, don't think about what I'm... And they said, okay, define all these standard, uh, all these standard states, define all these activities. But this is the true definition of a standard state. Because you can define a standard state Gibbs energy at any given pressure and temperature. And the bottom line that you have to remember is that if you add a certain pressure and temperature, a given reaction will have a certain value of its standard state Gibbs energy. If you change the temperature or you change the pressure of both, you will have a different value. But once you fix those, once you have your E. coli in your little beaker at one bar and say 25 degrees Celsius or 35 degrees Celsius, this will be a single numerical value. And for that reaction, that numerical value will never, ever, ever change. It's fixed at a given pressure and temperature. But if the chemical conditions, so it does, the important thing is this does not depend on the chemical composition of the medium, right? It only depends on pressure and temperature. Now there's another important equation in uh, chemical thermodynamics, which directly relates the standard state Gibbs energy of a reaction to the equilibrium constant of that reaction. So what does an equilibrium constant depend on? It can only depend on pressure and temperature. So a true thermodynamic equilibrium constant only depends on pressure and temperature. It does not depend on the chemical composition of the system. Where the chemical composition of the system comes in is through this Q. So you have a depends on pressure and temperature. You also have a depends on temperature here. All the chemical conditions <coughs> go into the Q, and that's why we call that the reaction quotient. And so the reaction quotient is defined 
as the product of the activities of the products raised to their stoichiometric coefficient over the product of the activities of the reactants raised to their stoichiometric <laughs> coefficients, right? Under whatever chemical conditions you are working in. So if, for instance, you have your sulfate reduces and the partial pressure of hydrogen goes up, this value will change. This value will not change, right? So all the change in chemical composition of the system enters <laughs> into this part. Yeah, so uh, that's the next slide. So I'll go to the activities. So the activities is really what, in some cases you can directly measure an activity, in most cases you cannot directly measure an activity, right? And so a whole branch of chemical thermodynamics is how do you get those, those activities. All right, so let's go back to our example. So we have our sulfate being reduced to sulfide. For aqueous solutes, in dilute solutions, the activities are approximately equal to the concentrations. Analytically speaking, we can measure this. We can measure this fairly easily. So we can measure concentrations. If you don't have a dilute solution, you have to start taking into account what we call non-ideal interactions. For instance, you can see, for instance, sulfate is negatively charged. So anything positively charged in the environment will get attracted to the sulfate or vice versa. So that will actually reduce the activity relative to the concentration. So we can think of the activity of solutes as the thermodynamic concentrations, as the effective concentration, right? So you have to subtract off any other interactions in the environment that might actually reduce it. But let's just assume that you can relate your activities to your concentrations. If you want to make this an, an, a perfect equal sign, you have to have what's called an activity coefficient. And there are s numerous theories to calculate these activity coefficients. For the, for the proton, it's actually easy. Because when you stick, I, love, I always love these papers where you read, the pH was measured by a pH meter. <laughs> Does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. No, a pH was measured with a ion specific electrode or a potentiometric electrode. And that measurement, the pH, is directly related to the activity. So the activity of protons, oh, sorry. Remember the definition of pH? This is the that's the definition of the pH. It's minus the logarithm on base 10 of the activity of protons. So whenever you take your first year chemistry textbook and they have concentration here, that's wrong. It's really the activity. So when you measure the pH, you directly measure uh, the activity of protons. So that's an easy one. Volatile species, like hydrogen, there the activity is in a sufficiently low pressure environment, like most atmospheric environments, is equal to the partial pressure of the hydrogen. And then finally, if you also have solids, for pure solids, the activity is 1. And then the solvent. If you have a dilute solution, the activity of the solvent, the way it's defined, is equal to 1. If you take, for instance, seawater, the activity of water is no longer equal to 1. It's about 0.98. But if we take freshwater environments, say a groundwater environment, you can typically apply this. And therefore, you can calculate <coughs> your reaction quotient. So all the information about the chemistry of the system is in the Q, in the reaction quotient. So if you can measure these guys, or you can estimate them otherwise, you can always calculate what your delta G is. If you can calculate your delta G, you look at the sign. If it's negative, yes, that process can take place. That process can generate energy. Some microorganism will use that reaction to generate energy to produce ATP. Yes? Should there be a coefficient to accept to deal with all the, the, the multipliers you put in there? Which multipliers? You have a, you have a, a equals approximately SO24, but, but there you said there's a coefficient that can be determined. Yes, the activity coefficients. Yeah. Yes, and so those, that's a, so if you would do that, you would end up with these activity coefficients also in there. So I've kind of simplified it. So we're dealing with a dilute groundwater. It's not a brine. It's not seawater. Because then these activity coefficients become very important. We should conclude soon. Yeah, I'll conclude soon. So. Life is redox chemistry, life is chemical disequilibrium, right? So if you, um, again, take this equation, remember that the delta G naught, the delta, the standard Gibbs energy change was related to the equilibrium constant. So you can also change this. You can rewrite this. So you replace your standard state Gibbs energy by minus RT ln kq. 
you combine it to logarithms and you get basically an equation that relates the, um, the ratio of the reaction quotient over the equilibrium constant to the delta G. And so you can now rewrite this because essentially the condition that the Gibbs energy of the reaction has to be negative translates directly in the fact that this ratio of the reaction quotient over the equilibrium constant has to be smaller than one. So this is something that you can always find out as a function of pressure and temperature. This is something that you have to calculate when you know the chemical conditions in the system and you can then check this. So we actually typically then define <coughs> one minus this ratio and that's the degree of disequilibrium. So what are the values that it can take? It can go from zero to one. So when is this equation going to be equal to zero? Under what condition? When? So when Q is equal to KQ, then it's equal to zero. But when Q is equal to the equilibrium constant, it means that the system is at equilibrium. When the reaction is at equilibrium, what does that mean? It's not going anywhere. So as long as the reaction cannot go, it cannot produce any energy, it cannot be used for. So zero means that you are at equilibrium. You cannot generate energy. The maximum value of, of this degree of disequilibrium is equal to one. When Q, this number here, Q over KQ, becomes very, very small, much, much smaller than one, then you have essentially one minus zero and you get one. So then you have maximum equilibrium. Should I stop? <coughs> One more slide? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <clears throat> it's all fine and well, but what is the relationship then between kinetics? So <clears throat> we just saw when a reaction is at equilibrium, <clears throat> so take, take again that reaction where the sulfur introduces. When that reaction is at equilibrium, it's not, going, it's not going anywhere. When delta G becomes negative, the reaction will start proceeding. When delta G is positive, it doesn't proceed at all. Now, think about it. You start from equilibrium and you start decreasing the delta G. So the delta G becomes more and more negative. So you're producing more and more energy. What do you think is going to happen with the rate of that reaction? Hmm? It's going to increase, right? So typically, if reactions produce, if you take the same reaction and the reaction produces a lot of energy, it will also go faster. So what you, and that's particularly true for enzymatic reactions because enzymatic reactions, enzymes are catalysts, so they make things go fast. So typically what you expect, and I've written it here as minus delta G of the reaction. So positive means that this delta G is negative. So the more negative delta G becomes, the faster the rate will become. But again, we're working with microbial reactions. There will always be some kind of a saturation. And so, of course, if you have a positive delta G, the reaction should not proceed. So what we call this, we say here, when essentially the rate has reached its maximum, there's no thermodynamic limitation. The reaction is going as fast as it can. It will never go faster. All the enzymes are functioning at their maximum rate. That's essentially the maximum rate. That's that same maximum rate as Monod derived for his E. coli. But in this regime, you see a thermodynamic limitation because depending on how big the minus delta G is, the rate will, be, will change. And then over there, we're in the thermodynamic inhibited system. All right. So I'll leave it here, but just to make the point that essentially, this is essentially how, when we describe these processes, we describe these processes, how fast does a microbe use up sulfate? Well, there will actually be a regime in which Thermodynamics does not play a role, but there will be this whole regime here where the thermodynamics will play a role. And that's why the bioenergetics comes in. And so given three more hours, I could explain how we deal with <laughs> this part. <laughs> the enthalpy of a reaction is related to the, the heat of the reaction, right? <clears throat> so what the Gibbs energy does is essentially you take the total energy of that total energy, because of the second law of thermodynamics, it tells you that no process can be 100% efficient. Now, for a chemical reaction, the efficiency is essentially how much of the energy is actually being stored in new chemical bonds versus how much energy is actually being released to the environment as heat. And the Gibbs free energy tells you that part of the total energy that is actually used to make and to create new chemical bonds. The other part, and that's kind of related to the entropy, 
That is basically the heat that is being dissipated in the, in, in the environment. And that's heat, that's, that's energy that is essentially lost. So the Gibbs energy at constant pressure and temperature is the usable part of the energy. That's the energy that can be used to generate new chemical bonds. And in this case, it's usually to generate ATP. It is, yeah. The delta G is essentially the energy that you can use to do work. So if you think about the Carnot engines and stuff like that, it's that part that is used to do work. And essentially, the, the efficiency is always less than 100%. Yeah. 